That's your like I don't think my knowledge. But it only was put there in the hard and like the garage. I don't think I'll find it. Wait, what do you mean? It's like if I have a feed pastor and I'm gonna pay for it to be alive if it's a thing. They'll close. They'll close the lot. At least the ones where I'm not sure about. Like for example, uh, <coughs> that new lot is like northwest. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? That's the bucket lot. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know what to do with that. I'm just guessing. I I know the closed lots like St. John's are closed, but like any other event, if they have like park event parking in there, you know, the people out there fucking money for people park there, just show your tag and that. Park in it for reasons security pick I've only had two times. Half the time I'm already parked in the parking lot when they started the so I was in you get a card for the uh the garage to take it across from the shop? Uh yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, we will get started. So, in the previous class, we uh, talked about a very important theorem which was uh, proposed by von Neumann back in 19, not proposed, but actually proved by von Neumann back in 1928, which said that instead of keeping track of all the preferences of all the people, uh, we can just work with their utility functions, right? So, that was the first conceptual leap. Right? So, in, if I'm talking about a decision problem, I don't have to worry about your preferences. All I have to worry about is what's your utility function. Right? So, that was a good thing. And the second thing that von Neumann said is that, well, we don't have to act according to a pure strategy. We can always toss a coin and take, pick one of the strategy that's, uh, pick one of the action that comes as part of, uh, comes as an outcome of the uh, tossing of coin. Right, so we uh, initially called it a lottery, but now onward we'll call it a, a mixed strategy. Uh, right, so mixed strategy means mixing the available actions that you have uh, through some probability distribution. Okay, uh, and the third uh, important uh, conceptual leap was the definition of an equilibrium in zero person in zero sum games. Right, so when you have two people and you are playing a zero sum game, there was a definition of equilibrium that he came up with and we talked about that equilibrium. So let me, in this particular class, I want to talk about what's the intuition behind defining uh, the saddle point equilibrium is, why exactly is it defined the way it is, right? And then we will take another conceptual leap that came, uh, that, that essentially was proposed by Nash, uh, which is what is, what should be an equilibrium for a non-zero sum game, okay? So that's the overall uh, train of thought for this particular class. So, we are still talking about zero sum game to begin with. So, uh, A is a matrix with M rows and N columns, okay, and row player is the minimizer, okay? So it's quite standard, very standard in game theory to take the row player as the minimizer and the column player to be the maximizer, okay? So the purpose, the whole point of row player is to minimize its 
cost, minimize the cost that it is going to pay uh, due to its action. So there is something called security security level, okay, which is for a row player. His question is, what is the maximum cost, maximum cost uh, he or she would pay? For the column player, what is the minimum payoff he or she can secure in the Okay. okay, so that's the question. So imagine you are playing a zero-sum game and you are a row player. What you would want to know before you participate in the game is what's the maximum cost that you are going to pay in this particular game. Okay, and similarly, if you are a column player, you want to maximize your profit, you want to maximize your payoff, and the question would be, what's the minimum payoff you can secure in the game? So let's, let's see what that number is going to be. So suppose you are a row player and your actions are uh, one all the way to M and for column player the actions would be one to N, okay? So row player picks i as his or her action. What's the what's the maximum cost that it is going to pay? Okay, so I am the row player. I have picked i as my action. What's the maximum cost that I am going to pay if I play with my action i? Any thoughts? Remember, a is a A is a matrix, right? There are multiple rows. And what I'm saying is if I pick, if I'm the row player and I pick this row, what's the maximum cost that I'm going to pay? Sorry? Maximum of the row, right? So it will be max over J, A, I, J, right? Or capital, let's keep it A, I, J. So A is a matrix of Aij. So if I want to, uh, so this is the maximum cost. If I want to minimize this maximum cost, what am I supposed to do? Right. So I'm. I don't want to pay the 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 cost. Right. I want to pay minimum cost. Minimum as as small as possible. So what do I have to do in order to find the minimum cost? Right, I'm going to minimize with respect to all my actions. Right, so this will be called Okay, this is the loss ceiling. Okay, this is known as the loss ceiling. And what is this? This is the maximum cost that you would pay in the game. Okay, this is the maximum cost you would pay in the game. And I'm going to call 
I star as argument of I max j a i j. Okay? And this would be called the security strategy of the row player. So this is Okay, so if I'm going to pay, play according to I star, which is the argument of this entire function, uh, I'm going to achieve the maximum cost that I can possibly pay in this particular game. I'm going to do the same, uh, same analysis for the column player and this would be called the gain floor. Okay, so what is the minimum gain, minimum payoff that I can secure in this particular game? What should the expression for uh, V bar, not V bar, it's, what's this? Uh, okay, I'm just going to call it gain floor. So what's the gain floor, what's the expression for gain floor is going to be? What do you think? Maximum. Maximum over j minimum over i a i j right because now i'm the i'm the column player so i can pick one of these columns and i want to uh, find the minimum payoff that i can possibly get uh, so that would be min of i a i j right so that gives me if i play according to column j what's the minimum payoff I can get and then I'm going to maximize among all possible payoffs and J star would be arg max J min I A I J and this would be called the security strategy of the column player. So what is the relationship between uh, the gain floor and the loss ceiling? Those of you who have taken 5759 know the answer, but those of you who have not will know the answer by the end of this semester, if you are enrolled in 5759. Okay, so my question is, what is the relationship between the loss ceiling and the gain floor. What do you think? What do you think? Loss ceiling is less than or equal to gain floor. They are equal? Less than or equal. So what is less than or equal to what? Okay. What's your claim? Oh, what's your name? Ahmed. So Ahmed claim is that the loss ceiling has to be less than or equal to the gain floor. Uh, who can refute that? How many of you think this is true? Okay, there's no support for you in the class. Okay, <laughs> so, so okay, so let me, uh, uh, so let me put a counter argument here, uh, not a counter argument, but counter claim. So since nobody believes this claim, so they have to believe the other claim, right? You can't not believe both of them. What about index? I, I 
the action, corresponding action taken, right? That's right. Yeah, so how do we, I mean, how does it have to be less than or equal to something? Uh, okay. Uh, so what's your claim? Are they equal? They need not be. I mean, they're just indices, so it should be the corresponding uh, entry in the pay of money. Okay, so let's 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 try to argue it out intuitively. Okay, this is the this is the maximum loss that player one can make, that the row player can make. Okay, so whatever is the maximum loss would be the gain to the other player, right? And this is the minimum gain that player two can secure, that the column player can secure for himself, right? And whatever he secures for himself would be the loss to this player, to the row player. So intuitively, what we would, uh, what, what, what the answer to this question should be, that the gain floor is always less than equal to the loss ceiling, right? It can't be the other way around, because that means this guy can, if if the loss is if the loss is lower than the gain it means that he can gain a lot more than the gain floor okay so gain floor is not right so this claim is is correct this is so sorry amon uh, i have to disappoint you uh, so so amon's claim is not right uh, so the gain floor has to be less than equal to the loss ceiling, and there is very easy proof for it. And the fact is, the, the way you prove it is max of aij over all j is greater than equal to min over i aij, okay? Or let me let me write it. Okay, so so if I take minimum over all i, so a i j certainly is greater than or equal to minimum over all i a i j, and if I take maximum over all j, then max over all j a i j is always greater than or equal to a i j. So now I am going to take. I don't want to delete this. Okay, so I am going to take minimum over i here. So I have min over i max over j min over i a i j right so for every j and this holds what this holds this holds for every i and j this holds for every j because i have taken minimum over i so this expression becomes a constant and this expression becomes a function of j only right because i have taken taken minimum over all i okay so this is a constant this neither depends on i nor it depends on j so this is a constant so a constant is greater than or equal to some function of j what happens if you take the supremum or maximum over all possible values on this side okay so my question is f of x is less than or equal to c If f of x is less than or equal to c, would max maximum of f x always be less than or equal to c, assuming that the maximum exists, right? If a function is below a constant, so this is my c, and a function is below this c, then the maximum of the function will also be below the level c. So what that would give me is the result. Okay, so any question? Any question on this? So let's do an example. And so my matrix
It's a three cross three matrix. I'm just putting some random numbers. Okay, and now I want to find the security strategy and security level of the rope layer. So if the rope layer chooses this, what's the maximum cost it would pay? If the rope layer chooses this, this is the maximum cost that the rope layer is going to pay. If the rope layer chooses this action, this is the maximum cost it would pay. If the rope layer chooses this action, this is the maximum cost it would pay. So what's the minimum of these three maximum costs? Two, right? So my I star is equal to three, and the V bar A is equal to two. Okay, so this is my loss ceiling. Now let's do the same thing for the column player. If the column player chooses this column, what's the minimum payoff that it's going to get? Right? That's the minimum payoff. If the column player chooses this column, this is the minimum payoff. If the column player chooses this column, this is the minimum payoff. Right? So what's the what's J star? What's the security strategy? It would be the maximum of all these three. Uh, so that would be one. So let me write I equals one. I equals two, I equals three. And my V bar A is equal to zero. So that's my gain floor. Okay? So if the column player chooses to play this game, this is the maximum gain he can expect to make, assuming the other player is can do whatever, no matter what the other player does, this is the gain he is guaranteed to make in this game. Now notice that there are entries with negative signs here. Okay, so he can potentially, if he does a foolish move, he can potentially make a negative negative payoff. He can get a negative payoff, right? But if he sticks to this strategy, no matter what the other player does. He is guaranteed to get at least zero, maybe even more, if he picks any of these strategies. Right? Same thing with row player. This is the maximum cost that the row player is going to, going to pay, no matter what the other player is going to do. Right? It can only be lower than this. So that's good. But still doesn't give us the feeling of an equilibrium. I mean, this doesn't, is I star, J star an equilibrium? Doesn't. Uh, doesn't seem like it because it doesn't give. Uh, why wouldn't it be an equilibrium? So what is one, three one? So this is so the payoff at i star j star is going to be equal to this number one. Okay. So is that an equilibrium? So what happens if if uh, is that? So the question is okay. I want to write down the question. The question is, is I star, J star in some form of equilibrium? Okay, let's think about it. Is it in some form of equilibrium?
So let's think about it. Suppose the row player says, I'm going to play according to, I'm going to play according to the third, uh, I star is equal to three. So that's third row is what I'm going to choose all the time. So what can, so knowing this, what can the column player do? Okay, if he knows that this, this guy is always going to play this uh, action, he's always going to choose j star equal to 2, right? He's always going to choose uh, j equal to 2. So it doesn't seem like j star equal to 1 is in some form of equilibrium with what the row player intends to do, right? So if, if i star, if row player plays according to i star, then best response is j equals 2, okay, because that maximizes the payoff. So that's not, so j equals 2 is not equal to j star. So this is not an equilibrium because a player, if I am, a, I am the column player, I don't have to stick to my security strategy, right? I can I can choose j equal to 2 and I can get a better payoff than what is guaranteed to me. So it's not an equilibrium. Okay. So let's look at another game. Three, one, negative one, one. Okay. So if I pick this row, what's the maximum payoff? What's the maximum cost I'm going to pay? This one, if I pick this row, what's the maximum cost I'm going to pay? It's this one. Okay, so my security strategy, I star, will be what? Two, this is I equals one, I equals two. Okay, and this is j equals one, j equals two. So what's the maximum payoff I can get? This, and what's the maximum payoff I can get if I pick j equals two? Any of these, right? So j star is equal to two. Right, so both of them are minimum. Oh, are we fine? Oh, yeah, sorry. Right, right. Here we were trying to find the maximum, so here it would be minimum. Okay. Okay, so J star, the security strategy is to act according to 2. Now, let's check whether I star, J star, is in some form of equilibrium or not in this particular game. So what should I do? Let's fix j star equal to 2. So let's assume that the column player has declared that he is always going to play according to his security strategy, which is j star equal to 2. So he's always going to pick this particular column. Then it's in the best interest for row player to pick, I mean, he's indifferent. He can pick either i equals 1 or i equals 2. So in particular, i star equals to 2 is a feasible strategy for the row player, right? Okay. Now if I, now, now let's do the opposite. Now let's assume that the row player has said he's always going to stick to i star equal to 2, which is its secure, security strategy. Then the column player will say, well, if he's going to pick this row, it's better if I pick j star equal to 2, right? That's his best response. That's what is going to give him the maximum payoff. So therefore, in this particular case, it turns out that i star, j star is in equilibrium, right? And that equilibrium is called saddle point equilibrium, okay? So 
what we have observed in this particular example is that in some cases the equilibrium doesn't exist in some cases the equilibrium exists but in cases where equilibrium exists in at least in the in pure strategy case so you're not mixing any strategy you're not playing according to a probability distribution you're fixing your strategy before the game begins so in this case right so that's the first result when your loss ceiling and gain floor are equal then the tuple of security strategies form a saddle point equilibrium okay uh, yeah can you please elaborate on the notion of equilibrium equilibrium so what is the notion of equilibrium here if I fix your strategy, I will do, so if you say that you are fixing your strategy according to some action, I will take, I will do what is best for myself, right? And the same thing for you. If I say that I am going to play according to this strategy, what you will do will be the best for yourself. So in this case, the role player is the minimizer. So if he fixes his strategy to i equals to 2, the column player will always maximize it. OK? Sounds? Uh, that's what we are getting at. But we want to understand what should be the definition of an equilibrium. OK? So what I'm saying is this I star J star seems to be in equilibrium, which was not the case here. Okay. Let's say I propose that the tuple of security strategy is some equilibrium. Okay. Let's, let, let's call it a Gupta equilibrium. Okay. The question is, is that equilibrium feasible? Is that equilibrium going to be played on the ground? And the answer is no, because as we saw in this case, if the row player fixes his security strategy, the co column player doesn't have to stick to his security strategy. He can play with any other strategy and he'll have a better payoff, right? So it's not an equilibrium. But in this case, it does seem to work well, right? Your I star, J star is an equilibrium. And the reason why it is an equilibrium is because the, the loss ceiling and the gain floor are the same. So security values coincide for both the players. And that's the first result, which is it will be called a saddle point equilibrium. Okay. So if the lower value and the upper value are equal, then I star J star, which is the security strategy, is a saddle point equilibrium of the zero sum game. Okay, any question so far? Yeah. Uh, my question is, are the players having different interpretation of their game matrix? What do you mean interpretation? Like one of them is calling the payoff and the other is calling the cost. Yes, so, so row player is the minimizer of the cost and the column player is the maximizer of the payoff. So when you are maximizing something, you are essentially, it's called a payoff, right? It's a payoff or utility or something of that. I mean, you give it a name which, or profit, right? So you give it a name which feels like you have to maximize it. But it's the same numbers, like, uh, the yes, that's because whatever this guy loses is what this guy earns. So this is true only for, uh, for two, two player zero sum games, yes, right? So when you are when you are in a shop, when you enter a shop and you bargain. 
the cost of whatever the material is, whatever you bargain is your gain, but the seller's loss, right? So that's a zero sum game. Okay, so this was the intuition for defining saddle point equilibrium. Uh, so the, the concept of equilibrium is if the other player declares its strategy, it should be best for you to act according to your equilibrium strategy. And same thing for the other player. If the other player has fixed its strategy or declared its strategy, then you should stick to your equilibrium strategy. So that's the definition of equilibrium. Okay, which is different from what was expressed in the movie, uh, Beautiful Mind. Okay, and those of you who haven't seen it, you should probably go and see it over the weekend. Uh, okay, so now the question is, in the first game that we saw, there was no secure, I mean the security strategies were there, but it was not an equilibrium, so what can we do? Well, Von Neumann said, why should we act according to pure strategy? We can always mix the strategy and that's always going to give us a better payoff. Uh, so that was his uh, final conceptual leap that said that let's mix strategy and the payoff would be, so if row player uses P in RM, or let me call it P in delta M as its mixed strategy. And the column player uses Q in delta M as its mixed strategy. Then expected payoff is expected cost to player one or row player anyone remembers what the expected cost was we did that yesterday summation summation ij aij pi qj which is the same as p transpose aq okay and so the obvious definition was for equilibrium, so P star, so that would be the definition. P star, Q star is saddle point, let me write it. Saddle point equilibrium if and only if. P star AQ less than equal to P star AQ star less than equal to P A Q star for all Okay, and he additionally, what he proved was every finite zero-sum game admits a saddle point equilibrium, uh, which can be computed using some form of linear programming, uh, 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 using a linear programming algorithm. We'll get to that algorithm in a, uh, maybe in the next class, uh, but, but that's, what, that's what Von Neumann suggested. Now the question is, what happens for multiplayer setting? Okay, this is for two person zero sum game. Can we extend this idea to non zero sum games? Okay, in zero sum games, it's called saddle point equilibrium. So we want to extend this idea to non zero sum games. So, what should the equilibrium definition be for non zero sum game? So, let's consider non zero sum two person non zero sum game and the matrices are m cross n
Okay, so A is the let's consider payoff. No, let's consider cost matrices. So A is the cost matrix of player one, B is the cost matrix cost of player one, cost of player two, and A plus B not equal to zero. Okay, so now I want to define the equilibrium. So P star Q star is a Nash equilibrium. What should the definition be? Okay, let's look at this expression and try and figure out what the definition, what the optimal definition. Uh, what, not the optimal, but what the definition of an equilibrium in non-zero sum game should be. So what is happening here? You know, wait a second. I have okay, so sorry, it's P A Q star and it should be P star A Q on this side of the inequality. Okay, please make that change. Yeah, you were saying something. Uh, in this case, uh, the column player maximizes. Right? In this case, column player maximizes, yes. No, sorry, the role player maximizes. Oh, I think I was right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was right in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, I was right in the beginning. Okay. But you might have defined it the other way yesterday. I mean, might have, yeah. 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 So A was the cost matrix or? No. It was the payoff for the payoff. Payoff, payoff, okay. Rho was the rho maximizer. Was the okay. Yeah. So in this class, rho is the minimizer. Uh, okay. Apologize for that. But let's say uh, player two wants to. Player two is maximizing here, and I'm talking about the cost. Okay, so what should my P star A Q star less than equal to what? So if the other player fixes his strategy to Q star, what should happen if I switch to some other strategy? Right, I should do worse off. I should be worse off. So this would be right now. I'm fixing player one strategy, and I'm trying to change player two strategy. Given the expected cost of player two, there should be a transpose here, and I should have right, and this should hold for all p. And this should hold for all Q in delta N. Okay, so that's the definition of Nash equilibrium for two person game. And you can extend this definition to N person game as well without any conceptual difficulty. Right? And the beauty of Nash equilibrium is remember, Nash equilibrium was proposed in 1951. And this was proposed in 1928-ish. So the beauty of Nash equilibrium is for the case of zero-sum games, they, the definition coincide. right? And why does it coincide? Because B is equal to negative of A right? for zero-sum game. And so you can come, you can come to this set of inequalities just by going through these set of inequalities uh, in the case of zero-sum game, okay? So again, the good thing is this equilibrium definition seems stable. So if I act according to P star, no, if the other person is going to act according to Q star, it is in my best interest to act according to P star. And same thing for the other player, if 
the first pair says he is going to act according to P star, then it is in my best interest to act according to Q star, okay, because that minimizes my cost. So von Neumann used some linear algebra to prove the existence of existence of uh, saddle point equilibrium, and the contribution of Nash was every n player finite non-zero sum game admits an equilibrium. Okay. So Nash won a Nobel Prize, I think in 1994 or maybe 1993 for this particular result. Okay. So, what I'm going to do next is to prove this, this result, okay? And this would automatically also prove the result by von Neumann, except that now we are going to use uh, much more sophisticated mathematics than what uh, von Neumann could use. Not could use, I think that by that time the main result was already there, which is used for uh, solving this, not solving, but proving this theorem. So. In order to prove the theorem, I am going to prove, not prove, but uh, Brouwer fixed point theorem. So I am going to introduce Brouwer fixed point theorem, which basically says the following, X is a subset of Rn. And I'm going to assume that X is convex, compact, X is a compact and convex set, yeah. Only com convex and compact set, okay? And F is a function from X to X. If F uh, is continuous, then there exists a fixed point. Of F, uh, that is X star equals to F of X star. Okay, so let's uh, let's think about it. Uh, even though I cannot uh, prove this result because it's fairly complicated proof, uh, I can give you a few examples. So let's say my x is a unit sphere in n dimensions. Okay, and I define my f of x equals to half of x. Okay, so I have a sphere in n dimension okay I have a sphere in n, in n dimension and I'm mapping f from the original set x to this range space x but I'm reducing the size of the circle right so initially I had circle so in the range space this is what the range of f is going to look like Right? But f is still a mapping from x to x. So f is a mapping 
from x to x. What is the fixed point? So what is the point x star that doesn't move when you apply the function f on it? Origin, right? So x star is equal to 0. OK? So that's pretty nice. Unit sphere is a convex set. And it's also a compact set. Right? It's closed and bounded. So this one works. Let's uh, let's change it. So let's say x is a triangle, and I'm going to map this triangle to a smaller triangle within this larger triangle. So let's say I scaled it in such a manner that this triangle gets mapped to this triangle. What's the fixed point? Corner. corner, right? This corner remains fixed. It doesn't move under the influence of F. So that's my X star. This would be F of X star. OK? So the point is, you have a compact convex set in Rn. You have a continuous function that maps the original set to the set itself, OK? It doesn't have to map to the entire set. As long as the entire range is within the set x itself, it's fine. So I have a function, continuous function, from x to x. There will always be a fixed point, which means that the point is not going to move under the influence of f, OK? So that was the result, I think, proved in 19, 10, maybe 11. OK, fairly old theorem. So let's see how Nash used Brouwer fixed point theorem to prove this result Okay, for two person case. And did Nash use Brouwer or Kakutani? Brouwer. Kakutani fixed point theorem came into existence in 1943, but it was not well known at that time. I think Kakutani was Russian and Nash was in US. So the exchange of idea during the World War II was not as good as it is now. OK. So what do we have? We have the, let's say my x. So I'm, I'm restricting myself to two player case. OK. Is it a convex and compact set? Right? Each delta m, each delta m is a convex set. Delta n is a convex set, convex compact set, and you are taking the product space, so that's also a convex and a compact set. Okay, so now I need to come up with a function f that maps x to x itself. So let's see what kind of uh, function he came up with. So let me define psi 1 of p and q as max of 1m p transpose aq minus aq 0 and psi 2 of PQ equals max 1N Okay, so what is this? This is the expected payoff to player one. So I'm taking a vector 1m, so 1m is 1, 1, 1, 1, m times, 
Okay, so it's a column vector with all ones, and I'm going to multiply it by a scalar quantity p transpose a q, and I'm going to subtract a q from it, and I'm going to take the maximum of the element here and zero. Okay, so max of two minus three, five, and zero would be two zero five. Okay, so it's element-wise, it's element-wise uh, maximization. Okay, with respect to zero. Same thing with psi two. Okay, one n is a vector of n ones, and this is a scalar. So you multiply that by vector of all one, and then you subtract b transpose p from it, and then you take the max with respect to zero. Okay, so we have achieved one thing. So psi one, psi one, maps p and q to a value which is greater than equal to zero. Right. So that's good because I know that every element in delta m and delta n has to be greater than equal to zero. So psi one does psi one and psi two does that. But what is missing? The sum of all elements here should add to one, right? So we are missing that that part is missing right now. So we should we should we should focus on that. So let me define t one of p comma q as p plus psi one p comma q over one m transpose. P plus psi one, p comma q. Okay. And same thing for T two. Q plus psi two over one n transpose q plus psi two. Okay, so now I define my function t from p and q space to the same space itself. So t is a function from delta m cross delta n to delta m cross delta n. Is t a continuous function? Is it a continuous function in p and q? Is it a continuous function? In P and Q. Okay, so this is a continuous function of P and Q. This is a continuous function of Q. So this is a continuous function of P and Q. And then max of. So max of. X and zero, is it a continuous function? What does it look like? It looks something like this, right? So it's a continuous function. So I'm composing. Two continuous functions here, therefore it's a continuous function, right? And this is also a continuous function of p and q, so therefore t becomes a continuous function of p and q. Okay, is that train of thought clear? Right? There is no discontinuity whatsoever in this entire map. So t is a continuous function that maps a Compact convex set to itself. 
So what's the result? T has a fixed point. Which means there exist P bar Q bar such that T P bar Q bar equals P bar Q bar. Does that prove the result? Does that prove the result? What else do we need to prove the result? Sorry? That what we need to prove is that P bar Q bar satisfies, still need to prove. If P bar Q bar is fixed point of T, then it is a Nash equilibrium. And in fact, we can prove another stronger claim is that if P star Q star is a Nash equilibrium, then it is fixed point of T. Okay? So in fact it goes both ways. Uh, claim 1 says that any fixed point of T is a Nash equilibrium. Claim 2 says any Nash equilibrium of the game is a fixed point of T. Okay? So let's, uh, I want to keep this here. Let's try to prove it right here. So let me prove claim two first because it's simpler. So if P star Q star is N E, then T P star Q star equals P star Q star. How do we prove it? So I know that P star A Q star is less than or equal to P star A Q and P star B Q star is less than or equal to no P star transpose B Q is that right? Okay, this follows from the definition of Nash equilibrium. So what is uh, the value of psi 1? So what is the value of, what is psi 1? P star Q star. Okay, so that would be P star here, Q star here, and Q star here, right? So 
so what does this give us p star a q star is less than equal to a q star uh, okay e1 transpose a q star so i am going to define a new notation so e i is 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 and this is in the ith position okay so what i am saying is since this holds for every p i am going to pick p equals to e1 and then e2 and then e3 and e4 and so on what does that mean p star a q star is less than equal to minus a q star or e i a q star is less than equal to 0. This is what we have. So what that would mean is this entire vector is less than equal to 0. It's the same thing because this is a scalar. You can put a scalar here or you can put a scalar here. It doesn't matter. No, it won't be zero. No. Uh, P transpose AQ can be any number. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a good point. What is one one multiplied by? Okay, let's that's fine. One over two, one over two. What is this multiplication? It's half, 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 half. Right? So what you get is a matrix multiplied by a matrix multiplied by a vector. So it still remains a vector. Okay. So what my what my point here is that P star A Q star, P star transpose. P star transpose A Q star is always less than or equal to A Q star. So therefore, this will always be equal to 0. Okay, and same thing with psi 2. Will be equal to 0. So if you look at every element of A Q, so A Q is a, is a vector, right? So look at the first element, it's going to be greater than or equal to p star a q star then you look at the second element that's also going to be greater than or equal to p star a q star right so this this quantity is less than or equal to 0 so psi 1 will be equal to 0 and same thing with psi 2 will be equal to 0 so what is t1 so what does t1 p star q star that's p star plus p star plus 0 over 1 transpose p star plus 0. What is that equal to? That's equal to p star, right? And same thing if you find out t2 of p star q star, that would turn out to be equal to q star. Right, so it's a fixed point. T of p star q star is equal to p star q star. Right, so if p star q star is a Nash equilibrium, then it's a fixed point of the map T. Okay, and the converse is also true, but because the proof is somewhat convoluted, I'll upload it online. I'll, I'll write it and I'll upload it on Canvas so you can take a look at it. But that's the most important claim. Okay, if P bar Q bar is a fixed point of T, then it is also a Nash equilibrium. So what does it mean? It satisfies these two set of equations. Okay, that's what you want to prove. And that I will upload it on the, on canvas. So you can take a look at it. I'll upload it uh, over the weekend. So you can take a look at it.
okay so i want to ask you if you have any questions on this on this proof even though the proof is uh, the the key the key insight not the key insight but the key uh, key step in the proof was to define this function t1 and t2 okay that's the key step so no matter how smart you are if you couldn't come up with this transformation you would never be able to prove that a nash equilibrium exists okay the second thing that you can notice is this is non constructive proof because brauer fixed point theorem is also non constructive there is no algorithm available to compute brauer fixed point theorem uh, so, sorry to compute the fixed point uh, compute the fixed point of a function f which is continuous okay so it's a uh, it's called a non constructive proof so brauer fixed point theorem has a non constructive proof so there is no way you can compute a fixed point of a function and therefore as of today there is no uh, algorithm to compute the nash equilibrium of a game of a even a simple uh, finite game with two players and by the way this result is far more general it works for all n players so even though i have written the proof only for two players you can generalize it to n players okay but there is no algorithm whatsoever to compute this fixed point okay any questions on this proof no yeah that's true for simple games you can still do it by hand but for complicated games you cannot like if you have 100 cross 200 stra actions you cannot do it by hand and joe has worked on it last year in 5759 so epsilon nash <laughs> yeah so there is this uh, notion of epsilon nash and you can compute not nash equilibrium but epsilon nash in polynomial time but the polynomial time is 15 hours okay it's not 5 minutes <laughs> So when you say a linear programming works in polynomial time it means maybe 5 seconds 10 seconds okay maybe 100 seconds or whatever 1 hour but uh, in case of epsilon nash the it's it's a polynomial time algorithm but it takes 15 17 20 whatever number of hours right so so that's the that's beautiful but not very useful Okay so next uh, in the next class I am going to talk about the linear programming like algorithmic aspects of of computing the equilibrium and why those problems are hard so for instance what I am going to do is I am going to formulate this problem finding a nash equilibrium as a bilinear optimization problem and those of you who might have studied optimization would know that bilinear optimization problems are non convex and therefore very hard to solve okay on the other hand finding a saddle point equilibrium would become a linear programming problem which is much easier to solve and in fact you have to do it as part of your assignment uh first assignment okay so we'll talk about those algorithms on tuesday thank you <laughs>